Yes, indeed. There is no forgiveness of sin in Christianity. And I want to explore this uh, seemingly absurd idea uh, with reference to uh, a book by John Hick uh, called The Metaphor of God Incarnate. Uh, he is a world-renowned philosopher of religion. And in his book, he uh, writes in chapter 12, uh, quite perceptively, I think, about the realities of Christianity. And he says, the basic fault of the traditional understandings of salvation within Christianity is that they leave no room for divine forgiveness, exclamation mark. For a forgiveness that has to be bought by the bearing of a just punishment or the giving of an adequate satisfaction or the offering of a sufficient sacrifice is not forgiveness, but merely an acknowledgement that the debt has been paid in full. So there's a big difference, is there not, between forgiving something and paying a debt in full. They're not the same, although Christians usually uh, treat them as if they were interchangeable, but they're not. One is actually forgiveness and mercy, and the other is paying a debt in full. But in the recorded teaching of Jesus, there is, in contrast, genuine divine forgiveness for those who are truly penitent and vividly conscious of their utter unworthiness. In the Lord's Prayer, we are taught to address God directly as our Heavenly Father and to ask for forgiveness of our sins, expecting to receive this, the only be condition being that we in turn forgive one another. There is no suggestion of the need of a mediator between ourselves and God or for an atoning death to enable God to forgive. Again, in Luke's parable of the prodigal son, that's in Luke chapter 15, the father, when he sees his penitent son returning home, does not say, because I am just as well as being a loving father, I cannot forgive him until someone has been duly punished for his sins. But rather, he had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring the best robe, put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and make merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And again, in the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, that's Luke 18, the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified before God. And yet again, there is his insistence that he came to bring sinners to a penitent acceptance of God's mercy. Go and learn what this means, Jesus said. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 9, 13. This was fully in accord with contemporary Jewish understanding. E.P. Sanders, the great American biblical scholar, in his authoritative work on Jesus' Jewish background says that the forgiveness of repentant sinners is a major motif in virtually all the Jewish material which is still available from the period. And it continues today in the prayers on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. For Judaism sees human nature as basically good and yet also with an evil inclination that is that has continually to be resisted. However, God is aware of our finitude and weakness and is always ready to forgive the truly penitent. In Islam, there is an essentially similar view. God is always spoken of in the Quran as Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, God the gracious and merciful. God knows our weakness and forgives those who, in the self-surrender of faith, bow before the compassionate Lord of the universe. In Islam, there is forgiveness of sin. In Judaism, there is forgiveness of sin. But if we believe that Jesus died as our substitute in our place to pay our debt for sin, that is not forgiveness. That is paying a debt 